Hello and welcome to When Will It End with a Vengeance. We are on the streets of we're on the streets of New York City. Yes. We are running around. We're not afraid to talk about race. We are actually. I, I, we're both. We're both. I think very uncomfortable with that prospect. Oh um, God! Yeah, no, we're, we we are not going to do that. But here's some safe ground. Rennie Harlan, get the fuck out of here! Get the fuck out of here! Wait, who's Rennie Harlan? Who's Rennie Harlan? He's the Finnish man who directed Die Hard Two: Colon Die Hard. Oh. Get the fuck out! Wait, can I try it? Can I try it? That sounds really fun. Wait, you do this thing with your thumb too? Get the fuck out of here! Get the fuck out of here! It's okay, okay, okay. Here, I'm Johnny. I'm Johnny McTee. Listen, you bitch! I just directed The Hunt for Red October, Medicine Man, Last Action Hero, and here I am back where I belong with my good friend, Mr. John McLean. Did you get the fuck out of here, Renny? So I didn't realize that. He's been to prison. He filed for bankruptcy multiple times. I, I did you know about this, Johnny T? What, uh, Johnny? Yeah, Johnny T's lived a life. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's like got, got his what he hired a private detective to listen in on what the producer of Rollerball. Oh, the whole Rollerball story is hysterical. <laughs> and then he went to jail, but he because he tried to get out of it the whole like something about the court case was thrown away but then brought back so because they brought it back they just like dumped down on him and then he what he thought was his appeal to get out of shit actually turned out to be a fucking nightmare and he had to spend more money and go to jail for an even longer sentence he spent a year in jail and then uh yeah he's, he's and he hasn't done anything since right what what happened to, to mctierns well he took a long break from like 2003 on he like didn't do shit i think he's since then well he was in jail <laughs> I mean, jail does make it a lot harder. Yeah. But some, okay, he's, he's played himself in uh, 80s blockbusters where Hollywood played tough. <laughs> oh, shit. So he just like, so he stopped. He went, what, Diary with a Vengeance, 95, Thomas Crown Affair, 13th Warrior, Rollerball, Basic. Done. Out. And that's the last we fucking heard from our friend, John McTiernan. He said, look, I said all I had to say with rollerball and basic. <laughs> Let me go to jail in peace. Let's talk Johnny McTee. Uh, married to Carol Land, 1974. Divorced, 1984. Married Donna Dubrov, 1988. Divorced, 1997. Married Kate Harrington, 2003. Divorced, 2012. Married Gail Sistrunk. Wikipedia delightfully says married after 2012. He does a 10-year thing. Yeah, he goes through pretty clear eras with his wives. This isn't and he's like, like... It's been 10 years. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I said it Boy, to... Are you ready? Rennie Holland? I said it to Rennie Holland and I'll say it to you. Get, Get the, the fuck, fuck out of here. <laughs> oh, Johnny. I'm going for you as Halloween. John McTiernan uh, roaming the streets, getting candy, yeah. and then telling you to get the fuck out of here. And then they're like, Get the Wait, fuck out of here. This is my well, house. That's great because, look, we saw Die Hard 2 and we were like, Look, this is very annoying. Because Rennie Harlan's like, I'm not going to do a Finnish accent. I'll just do a European accent. John McClane is the coolest guy. I wish I was myself, John McClane. John McClane is so cool. That's Me, really Rennie good. Harlan, I wish I was myself, a John McClane, New York City beat cop. I started looking at an ad on IMDb for the stand and just like hearing that voice, I, did, I I was transported away from the podcast and somewhere in Europe. It was, wow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just getting out of the Nolan thing and I feel like, again, there's another script here. There's another script here about accents and transportation. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to work on it. I'll okay, get so, you so a copy. So Rennie Harlan Die Hard 2 is like, nothing is cooler than this guy, John McClane. You've seen the first one. He's crazy. This guy. He always writes. He always shoots the right so, guy. So, he, he's so good with the gun. You see, he's crazy. I wrote, with the help of friend, this scene where there are blue bullet thingies and red bullet thingy, and no one else ever would figure out the blue bullet thingy except for my dearest friend, John McClane. I love John McClane. He's my friend. And John's like, Renny, you dumb motherfucker. Get the fuck out of here. John McClane sucks. Wait, John McClane, is, is he John McTiernan? I would argue he just said the John McTiernan that Johnny McTee, based on the life. No, I'm saying that's McTiernan 
talking to Rennie. He's like, oh, Rennie, oh, okay. You know, success. He sees himself in John McClane. He sees this guy when he's young and dumb and full of cum. And I know that's from Point Break, but please let no, me have it. my fun. Use it. Let me have my fun. He says, Die Hard won, yeah, it all. Look, you get in a fight with your wife, big deal. I'm John McTiernan. and I've gotten in fights with wives for four of them. fucking years. <laughs> Just wife after wife after wife. I have gotten so so he's you know, so he's kind of gung ho. He's only in it like he's only like if I'm getting this right, he's only really He's just married his second wife with Die Hard. To him, the world is, you know, an oyster. 1995, he's really in the later years of a second of four marriages. So he's like, marriage, it's tough. It's tough for me. John Tiernan. So by the time we get to Die Hard 3, he's like, oh, John McClane's like a drunk fucking piece of shit who smells bad, is racist. His wife hates him. He is not charming. No one is charmed by him. Everyone is like viscerally disgusted by his sociopathic desire to kill and maim. The the his his counterpart, the brilliantly played Zeus by by Sam Jackson, is like, bro, like life is harder for me. It's hard being black in America. And John McClane's like, I don't fucking know. Probably not. You're the racist. Right. The whole movie. That scene is good. That honestly, that scene is good in every way. I, I know. Again, we just got out of. Nolan verse. Stop like, referencing that. Stop. I'm Are you sorry. Stupid? I'm sorry. I'm just stuck there. This is the there. main feed podcast. Not everyone has the oh, Patreon. Oh, shit. That's they right. Should. Not everyone just listened to that. That came out a Do couple you days think? ago. Fuck. Do you ever think before okay, you talk to real s- Rennie Harlan? Should I stop saying I've it? I've seen this movie Tenant. It's so confusing. I love it. What does even happen? Do you have a scene which is literally like a puzzle for children enacted by John McClane, the fucking racist asshole, and the like oh it's brilliant like that scene everyone knows it it's like the most memorable part of this movie and when you watch it again you see why because it just fucking works that's you think that's the most memorable scene in the movie is the the jug yeah i mean it's i just think what it does in a few minutes can sort of there's so many great scenes this movie is weird it actually sort of has fuck i'm get back to nolan just about to talk about just about, just, talk, just, just about to talk about fucking Dark Knight. Your self sabotage is so just crazy. About, just about to talk about Dark Knight. Fuck. You're a regular John McClane. I'm Holly McClane. Okay. You're Holly. I have. I'm professional. Mm, I love I you, shit baby. Together. I love You're you a drunk. so much. You're a drunk and an asshole. What happened to my name? Fuck you. <laughs> I'm glad we don't write scripts. This is harder than you think. I gave a lot of shit to fuck. I just about to talk about Nolan again. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm not so sorry. I'm so even sorry. Even joking when I say stop. Oh, okay. Okay, new screenwriter. Steven D'Souza, get the fuck out of here. John Hensley, get on in, baby. Get Wait, in the hot tub with what, your main man. Wasn't one of them the same? No. Mm. So, okay, the thing about Die Hard as a franchise, which we did not talk about in the, the last episode, Die Hard 2 wasn't supposed to be Die Hard 2. It was adapted to become Die Hard 2. It's called 58 Minutes is the source material for that. It has nothing to do with John McClane, it was grandfathered in because they were like, we're just going to make this Die Hard 2. Same fucking thing with Die Hard with a Vengeance. Right. So that's the, Same that's, fucking thing. It is weird that the first one is also an adaptation of a book that doesn't have a sequel, I'm pretty sure. And then it is this, this character does allow for you to put him in any tense situation where things might explode and things might get stolen. And I really like that there's that looseness where John McTiernan can take back over with a script that wasn't intended to be a Die Hard movie, make a few changes, and suddenly you have a Die Hard movie. And this is like so like so different than what we're used to with franchising right now, where like Marvel has like planned out forty years of the franchise where nothing the like everything has to fit precisely in this big story. And it is so refreshing to be like, oh, like this is just like we're in it. Not to watch John McClane because he sucks, but he works in this movie. Like this movie allows for a John McClane that actually is like substantive and something that I want to watch rather than in the second one where I'm just like, I don't well, they're want just, any they're, of they're this. They're picking up. Remember the the old computer game, uh, Good and Evil, or no, Black and White? What was it? You play yeah, a yeah, god. Yeah, Black and White, the god. You play yeah. as god. And, and, yeah. and you, just get, you have this awesome floaty hand. You just like yeah. pluck up peasants and drop them places. It's amazing. 
I played it for hours as a kid, just picking up peasants, dropping them in the ocean. Picking up peasants, dropping them in a volcano. Anyways, nothing, no need to read into that. But uh, th- that's what they feel like with old McLean here, where they're like, we're going to drop in the sandbox and baby, it's going to be fun. But Charles, before you blather on with your dumb fucking mouth, let's talk about Jonathan Hensley for a minute. Can we talk Hensley? Who's Who's Hensley? The guy who wrote the movie. Oh, the guy who wrote the movie. Yeah, let's get him in here. You got him on the phone? Bring, bring. Hello, I'm just a simple Southern screenwriter, Jonathan Gosh, Hensley. Not everyone listened to that. Uh, Jonathan Hensley went to UMass Amherst, Weston Mass, oh, really? baby, Zumass Slamhurst. Whoa, he looks like he went to like Wyatt Earp School. Well, hold on. Uh, Wyatt Earp School is where I got my BA. Um, he went to Tulane University in Old Nolens, so maybe he is a good old fashioned mm. a Southern screenwriter. Anywho, um, okay, things he has written. You ready for this shit? I'm ready. Tell me, tell me, tell me. His first big movie? Die Hard with a Vengeance. Now, now, two years ago, before that, in 1993, he wrote A Far Off Place with Reese with, Reith Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon. Never heard of it. Not interested. After Die Hard, he writes a little movie called Jumanji. Ever heard of that? Talk about a fucking franchise. Wait, really? Wow. After Jumanji, you know what he writes? A little movie called... No, he doesn't write it. Sorry. He, he, then he, he, he's EP on Con Air, 97. Wow. Then he writes a little movie called The Saint. Oh, my which God. Which I saw in theaters me too. and scared me. That's Val, right? That's Val. 1998, you sitting down? Armor friggin' Geddon. Wait, what? Have I not like, heard of this 2000? guy? 2000? EP on Gone in 60 Seconds. Now, did he write... The famous exchange between Angelina Jolie and Nick Cage, where she asks him, what's better, having sex or stealing cars? I can't remember what the other line is, but it's a good question. Um, and also, he worked on The Rock, but didn't get credit, uh, which is interesting. And then, this is just for you and me, baby. Mm-hmm, I think you'll find mm-hmm. this funny. This speaks to the cultural impact of the film Gemini Man. It is referenced in his Wikipedia by saying some unrealized projects Hensley has worked on include a Gemini Man film. Wait, what? He made so no a- one, no one. He worked on Gemini Man, but it, it, no one. So little of a shit is given about that movie that no one even <laughs> updated. Well, also, his, there were his like forty different versions of it because it was written in the early '90s and then just like passed along, like ugh, probably some diseased cat or something until until Ang Lee finally was like. You know what I can make with this diseased cat? Something Will Smith will just jump around in and 140 million frames per second. Wow. Now, 2004 comes back. He makes his directorial debut with what you ask? Oh, a little Tom Jane picture called The Punisher. I never saw that one. Talk about some. This that, this is a 2004 Marvel, so it doesn't really count as the. It's nowhere near the MCU. Uh, 2007, he writes Next. Nick Cage, baby. Oh, shit. I saw that. Hell yeah. That was really bad. <laughs> yeah, 2007, he makes a found footage docu-fiction horror film called Welcome to the Jungle. Looks bad. Uh, then he made Kill the Irishman in 2011, one of these period piece crime movies that no one's ever heard of. The, this one stars Vincent D'Onofrio, Christopher Walken, and once again, Valley Kilmer. And in 2021, you can look forward to the Jonathan Hensley directed and written The Ice Road, starring one Liam Neeson. Ever heard of him? Wait. Is that the sequel to the other Liam Neeson movie where he drives around on an ice road? What Who's that? to say? Cold Pursuit. Did you see Cold Pursuit? I didn't know. It does, this one does co-star Larry the Fish as Goldenrod. Why'd you just do that? So that's cool. Why'd you, why'd you just read us a bunch of movies that this guy was involved in? Well, Charles. Just to give you a flavor of uh, the man himself? I don't know if you remember the whole point of this fucking project, the whole idea. The galvanizing notion behind this year podcast is to say... When we sub players in and out, of, let's use a basketball metaphor, okay? Okay. Let's yeah. say you're the you're the point guard, okay? I don't know what that is. Not important. You've been running around. You've been you've been okay. throwing the ball up, making yeah, yeah, assists, yeah. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. dribbling. Yeah, I know what that is. You're you're tired, right? You're tired. Yeah. Maybe your second quarter of the game is not as good as your first quarter because you're a little sleepy. Now you're gonna want a good second point guard to get off the bench and get in the game. Am I right or am I right or am I right? Yeah, let me take a little nap, right? Yeah, you're gonna take a little nap. Someone else is gonna get in here. Steven D'Souza got all tuckered out from writing Die Hard, straggles, just slumps into Die Hard 2, and writes a real stinking turd. And the coach says, Get the fuck out of here. We got John Hensley. 
Hensley, you better write us a damn good diehard. He did. So that's John Hensley. You wrote a damn good diehard. Diehard with a vengeance maybe is better than diehard. I rewatched uh, Armageddon recently over the summer. Really good. Really fucking good. I really liked it. If you only remember it from that song. I don't want to close my eyes. I don't want to fall asleep because I miss you, babe. And I don't want to miss a thing. Yeah. I'm getting emotional. That made me emotional. Yeah. If that's all you remember, well, good for you. Good for you. Good for you. Uh, no, uh, let's talk Die Hard with a Vengeance. Okay, let's just remember, let's think back on our little heads here. Okay. What do we like so much about friggin' Die Hard, okay? We liked, there's so much, mm, what's that? What's that? Texture. What's that? Mm, mm, grit. A bit of grit. Grit. Yeah, grit. Okay, okay. What's the most textured, gritty place in the world? A place so renowned, so full of character, so full of stories, that frequently... It is almost like a character itself in the films that take place in it. Well, you know, I, I sometimes call attention to the notes that I write down um, to talk about while we're, we're talking on the show. And my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, eight, sorry, seventh. I just went right past it for some reason. Seventh note. Is it, is it seven or eight? It was seven. Yeah. So I don't know. I was just, I liked counting and I just got carried away. I, I got to eight, which was, and I'm going to marry Donald Trump. But before that, my seventh note was, City is like a character. Which city, I'm saying? Oh, the New York City. Yeah, the New York City. This film... Okay, what so many we stories. Were like, we were complaining so many stories, and this one's ours, okay? We were complaining in two that the airport is a very unsatisfying location. We didn't like how it's vacuous so and blobby. how poorly defined it was. Baby, on paper, you're like, you're going to put John McClane, the craziest cop in America, in the biggest city in the world? He's going to get lost. Yeah, I mean, that was my main concern throughout the whole movie was pre-cell phone. And even if he'd be one of those guys that like held out using a razor until like 2018. So he would never even have GPS. He'd always be like, through the park. He'd be just like driving his daughter around to school. Through the park. 30 minutes from Harlem to Columbus Circle. That's got to be a record. Uh no, he doesn't get lost because it's a grid system. That, then I mm. remembered, oh, it's a grid system. And then I was like, okay, now I can watch the movie without this yeah. fucking like sickening fear. I'm really sorry. to I keep doing it. I'm sorry. But Nolan would have had oh, a line. Oh, God. Damn it. I'm sorry. But Nolan would have had a whole scene in the movie where Sam Jackson and Bruce Willis talked about the grid system. Okay. I'm sorry, but it's nice to know that they are in a grid system without having the characters remind me, okay? Now, let me say something else that I, we like about Die Hard 3, colon with a vengeance harder. You need to have a sexy villain who you kind of want to watch fuck. Right, and that's, so that's what I thought the opening scene in the second one, uh, sexy villain that I'd love to watch fuck. If you remember, everyone, I gave my MVP pick to basically to William Sadler's ass. Yeah, and basically I sort of updated to his entire muscul- musculatory system. All of his muscles were fucking great. But those glutes, mwah, those glutes. Now, the glutes stole the show. Yeah, um, but it's Jeremy Irons we don't see as much. You see a little of those pumping pumping irons. Do you think he's ever getting called pumping irons? Old Jeremy, Jeremy Irons, pumping irons. Old, old Jeremy Irons, pumping irons. Think so? Maybe uh, if he ever is getting fucked from the back. Oh, someone's like I was pumping iron the other day, and they're like, oh, 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 oh. "Jeremy, you having sex with Jeremy Irons?" And they're from like, ba- "Yeah, from the back." I was having, I was railing Jeremy Irons. It's called pumping irons. Like, think, that's well, maybe that's a be... wild story. This gets a little confusing because you're both railing and pumping him, but I guess you can do both at once. You're I talented. think both verbs are are descriptive enough that yeah. we get what's going on. You know, now let me let me throw this at you. We got Jimmy Irons in there filling the big old Alan Rickman hole, and on paper, you're like, oh, it's it's his brother. That's original. In real life, you're like, yeah, Hans would have a fucking dope-ass brother. Also, I Hans, mean- Hans would have a cool brother who had a clever would. idea also. Hans definitely vibes like bo- like shitty, boring younger brother. The one that was born like, you know, just enough to get to watch all the TV he wanted and 
get to play on his like whatever switch box or or ps3 or whatever he had back then where jeremy irons has to like you know had to deal with this shit wasn't allowed all that stuff got beat by his dad took all the beatings i don't know like there's that, that that's the that's the vibe even without knowing a jeremy irons existed i knew just from watching the slinky little hans from the first one that he had an older brother and this delivers on that very feeling this little twinkle in Rickman and Irons' eyes. They both got the little twinkle where they're like, we're, yeah. we're having a bit of fun. We are ultimately having a bit of fun. Right. And there's serious parts, but they are having a bit of fun. Um, so I mentioned earlier Sammy Sam Jackson and plays Zeus in this and Zeus owns Zeus Carver, a one of the best movie names we've encountered ever. Zeus Carver? Get out of town. Sam Wheat. Get the fuck out of here! Hey, get the fuck out of here! Also, you know that that's a that's a that's a downtown movie. That's a downtown movie. Ghost. Yeah. Ghost is a down. That you're in Soho. Right. Get that's the downtown. Fuck get the fuck out of here! We are uptown. Yeah. Uptown girl. Dies <laughs> <Hard> girl. <laughs> so Larry the Fish was gonna play Zeus, but he he turned it down. I don't know why. He keeps doing that, right? Isn't are there multiple stories about him being like, eh, I'll just do this. I don't know. I like Larry the Fish. I'm glad he's doing what he's doing. I think Sam Jackson was fucking perfect for this movie. Yeah. So it's, it's, Sam Jackson has said in interviews, this character, Zeus Carver, is the closest to his actual personality that he's ever played on film. And okay, we were anxious going into this, remembering it as a racist movie, where we were because of the politics of Die Hard, where it sort of relentlessly glorifies the behavior of a reactionary, conservative, white vigilante. Or satirizes Ye- the behavior of... Okay, a yes. If you're a lo- loser who's wrong, that. A professor. Okay. okay. Academia is a curse. Um, so when you get to three, you're like, oh, one, very conservative movie. Two, apolitically idiotic, has no politics other than John McClane is cool. Right. So you're like, this, this is not... This is not going in a good direction. But Die Hard 3 rules because Zeus is smart and capable and clever and likable and morally driven and just the kind of guy where you're like, I would love to learn more from him about how to live. Yeah. And he is in shark, shark contrast. That's, a, that's an expression when you have two things and one's a shark and it's bad. He's in shark contrast to John McClane, who again – Literally everyone is mortified by, and it is so sick that there's a black protagonist in the face of this white loser who sucks, who deals with cowardly white cops sticking guns in his faces, condescending shitty Wall Street bankers talking down to him. All these situations that underscore in a post Rodney King world, which again they fucking they, they joke mentioned. about in the movie. Yeah. Like, yeah, white cops are problematic and suck, and this movie weirdly they figured out how to do that in a way that did not make this another rehash of the reactionary politics of Die Hard 1. Yeah, it was weird that, like, the opening scene where he's talking to... I didn't even... I didn't quite catch the relationship. Were the, who were those boys in the beginning? They're just some neighborhood kids. And they're... Okay. Because of Fat Tony or Big Tony or whatever Tony's deal was, Zeus is like, look, guys, don't take radios from Fat Big Tony. Go to school. Don't take help from white people. White people are fucking awful. They will just stick guns in your faces and murder people in front of you and scream at you. Not cool. Yeah, I think so. That's what I was going to say. Like his opening scene with the kids is. It's like it's very direct, but it's done really well in a way that gives us access to this character that he cares really much. He, he, He cares so much. I thought they were related to him. The amount of love and attention he gives to these kids. Like the whole end of this movie is about not because they were both black, Charles. Wait, what now? Hmm. I'm calling you a racist. Okay, cool. That's fine. Um, the because at the end, they're like the whole emotional stakes of the movie are these two boys are about to be blown up at a school that, and he's like, "Fuck, we got to go save these kids." Specifically, these two kids that I know. I just I thought there was a fam- a family thing, but maybe maybe I should check my my uh, my racial. Why do you just go back to these things over and over again? Like they're not winning. Yeah, I, I like I my my dad just told me like you gotta just stay in your Charles, losses think very until they're carefully. gone. Okay, thank you. Phew, I was really afraid you're gonna share your dad's <laughs> racial advice, and I was like, I don't. <laughs> we're gonna stop recording. <laughs> no, but the opening that opening scene where you meet him, and then the sign where 
uh, Bruce is out there wearing his his I hate sign. I don't know. It just like it's it's very it is weird because this is another one of those movies from the 90s where it's a white team making a movie about black white relationships in 90s America. So it's sort of I don't know. It's it's weird. I'd- I think the point is this: Zeus is a Zeus is a fully realized character who we sympathize with, understand, care about, and and his motivations are the classic hero motivations. John McClane's motivations seem to be that he's like a guy who just fucking guns people down without caring, will destroy anything, will risk people's lives. Like it's. I think that contrast shows that this is not like john's cool and everything he does even when he's being racist is cool it's this guy is like an unhinged lunatic and zeus is putting up with him to like do something we actually understand because john's motivation it seems like he's on the the, the very edge of just cracking at any second i'm sorry to, to go back to one i know i burned the professor hat i unbuttoned the hat hashtag it where do you feel like he's not like, what do you think is different about this movie other than him being, like, hung over and actively talking about how he doesn't, like, he, his wife hates him, where, like, he's because, not... Because... Because he wins at the end of this movie, too. No, okay, the point he is in one... He solves the, the crime and gets all the bad guys. The point of one is that is that he's disgusted by L.A., He's he hates these fucking Europeans... He hates the top brass upstairs, and he's, you know, despite his mistakes, he's proven that his way was the right way to do it, and his wife takes his name back, and everyone says, John McClane, he's the coolest guy in the world at the end. Okay. And this one is very different. So I guess, where, yeah, he's not cool. I just, I guess maybe it's because I don't really find him to be, I know- He's suspended not getting back in this job. fight. Yes. His wife, like, doesn't want to talk to him. He, at the beginning, is hungover, and people are like- you smell like dog shit. Like you specifically smell bad. So I guess you just you just like that it's very clear this time. I like that in the first movie we're shown a guy who, you know, the the the, the whole thing of it is like, look, he's not he's not your textbook guy, but he gets the job done, and dang it, he's he got the right. job done. But I mean, it's not the right. same in this case. He's just he's he's allowed to go back and be a cop again, and he gets the job done against the. Whimpering police okay, in the he NYPD. Gets, he gets to be a cop again early in the movie only because they have to because they're afraid that someone's going to bomb Manhattan s- school buildings. Right. No, At I'm the end of the movie, he's... He is not, he's not enveloped by a cheering crowd of people. He's like alone with his friend who's like, dude, call your fucking wife. Yeah. What is wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, no, like, it's... Not, I guess I like, no. I agree with you that three is this. I just get a for me. I still get that same vibe from one, and I feel like John McTiernan. Why do you think if you think the first one is a remnant of this like every man white vigilante with a gun? Why do you think John? It's McTiernan not a would, remnant. It was eighty eight. It was the height of that attitude. No, I'm saying if in twenty twenty Die Hard is a remnant of that era, why do you think that Die Hard three from the same director would be so different? Well, I was joking earlier, but I'm sure John McTiernan's life changed a lot in seven years. And, I, you know, Interesting. he didn't. So I, I think most importantly, D'Souza didn't write it. I think all of the directorial aspects of one, that that's pretty apolitical. It's just a brilliantly made movie. And three, we have a similar really tight, really visually coherent, really exciting, constantly engaging, like tight movie that moves as a propulsiveness to it. But you get rid of D'Souza and, you know, Hensley's take on it is just so much more interesting. And what's interesting, I yeah. think, is that reading about it, um, one, McTiernan calls the plot of the movie frail and outrageous. I hope people enjoy its ridiculousness. That's from McTiernan about the plot of Die Hard 3, which is hysterical. He was like, this is stupid. And uh, Hensley, in the DVD commentary, he says that like the basis of his idea for this movie was what if one of his childhood friends who he, who he threw a rock at decided to get revenge on him as an adult. Okay. Wow. So Hensley's Sick. entering this being like, what if this like petulant, violent, childish behavior had consequences that I had to deal with as a deeply damaged adult? And I, I, I just, what I'm saying is there's an emotional quality to how McLean is put forward in this that is completely missing from the first one. We're not sympathizing with him. We're like pitying this like broken man child who's like obviously is a fucked up dude. Okay. 
I find him at the end of Die Hard 1 to be as repulsive as he is in Die Hard 3. And I don't think, Josh, this is a fucking podcast. You're, you're I, mistaken. You should be making fun of me for fucking saying what I want to say to you. No, I feel like Charles, I can't talk you're, you're to you confusing, right now. You're confusing uh, your personal feelings about I'm him. I'm not. Versus I'm saying if John McTiernan. I'm just saying Die if, Hard if John Mc, shears on McLean. That is unambiguous. Okay, it is never mind. You, uh, Die Hard it's not, 3. It's not fun to talk to you right now, so let's just move on. Why are you upset? We went over this in, the, in Die Hard it's 1. Just, we're not, let's just move on. Just go to the next thing. Just go to the next thing. I'm just going to drink some okay. seltzer. When Zeus was given the dollar bill, that was improvised. Wow. That was That's great. kind of fun. That was a great good. business. You think so? So this is the only Die Hard film where John McClane doesn't risk his life to save Holly or his kids. And the actress who played Holly said, I'm out. I am not doing a third one. Two get the fuck out of here. <laughs> she said to the Die Hard franchise, Die Hard, get the fuck out of here. I'm Bonnie Bedelia. Oh, yeah? Her, her she name, added her name on there just to make it a little less confusing. So speaking we, of her we, wife. We, hold on. We haven't talked enough about her name being Bonnie Bedelia. Yeah, that's Do you think funny. she's related to Amelia Bedelia? I think she is. I saw her name in the credits after watching the second one. I was like, wait, that reminds me of a little child's book I used to read. What was her, Amelia? what was Amelia Bedelia's deal? I'm gonna look it she up. She was the goofy nanny, I think, that was like brain dead and just like did a bunch of weird shit. Oh, Huff she was glue. stupid. Yeah, she yeah. was the dumb nanny. She was stupid. Yeah. Okay. She um, was like, "I'm a dipshit. I'm just do everything literally." I have a question for you because I feel like this movie does what I like to do for movies I don't like in franchises, and I do you. So when he's telling Zeus the story of how he is now in New York without his wife. It seems like they just got rid of two. That's... I'm having a hard time understanding how if they both live together in LA and the second one took place in DC and they're still married and they love each other. He's like, you know what? She was in LA. I was out here in no, New hold York. On, hold on, we got hold into on. a fight and I never called her back. We, uh, well, let's point out the obvious thing. We have nothing to gain by figuring this out. Well, that's true. That said. We, we have very little to gain by doing anything on this show. Oh, I don't know. I think people, they walk away from this being like mad at themselves. And that's like an impact we can have on them. They yeah. can be like, why the fuck did I listen to that? I think walking Shit. down this road will anger them. Let's walk down the road. Okay. So, um, in two, they're visiting her in-laws in D.C. Right. Yeah. He is picking her up from the airport for whatever, assuming she's busy at the friggin' Nakatomi Corporation. Right, she was flying in from Europe, though, right? Or no, she was flying in from L.A.? Who knows? I can't remember, and I refuse to go back. <laughs> so, whatever. Nothing about 2 is unwritten by this, but I do like that the thing in 2 that I was really incensed by, and listeners of the prior episode will likely recall, I did not like that they kept saying that they were doing it all over again for a second time. I thought it was cheap. Yeah. And this movie... I agree. Thank God, no one goes... I'm John McClane. I can't believe once again I'm contending with a Gruba brother. What, another, uh, just, uh, another, just another talking day, about another that Gruba? is making me mad. Can you imagine? Like every movie is like that. Every movie is like a sequel is about the same person doing some more shit. Why would they think that was a good idea as the writer to be like, hmm? Anyway, we already talked about that. You know what I like that they threw in as the new recurring theme? It's the height of summer, but you know what? It's still a fucking Christmas movie because they're talking Santa Claus. They're talking reindeer. They're talking all this shit. It's a fucking Christmas movie. I vote. I know that not everyone does because they're still not sure about whether the first one is. I vote three as a Christmas movie as well as both two and one. Wow. So that's my standing. I vote. This I resolves voted. the big debate. Is Die Hard 3 a Christmas movie? Yes. I vote yes. What do you vote? I need your vote. Wow. Uh, you know, in the spirit of reconciliation, because clearly Die Hard has proven to be more divisive between us than I thought it would, I want to show you good faith and say, yes, yes, this is a Christmas <gasps> movie. You think so, too? Hey, fellas, Mickey O'Brien, Aqueduct Security. Hey, listen, we got a report of a guy coming through here with a uh, eight rain. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. He said he was a jolly old fat guy with a snowy white beard. Cute Can't miss him. Suit. I'm surprised you didn't see him. This movie is sick because John McClane like brutally murders people and almost everyone who sees him do it are like, holy shit, dude, what the what the fuck? The truck driver, yeah. Zeus, everyone's like, what? You just, you have, you have no feelings about this? Like you just like blew these people to bits? He's like, hey, another day, another dollar. Oh, him. Hmm. 
Yeah, I want to be a. He this movie. I forgot how gory it was. Like the the violence in this movie is at the level where it's disgusting. Um, like just a dude literally gets cut in half and they drag his body away in pieces, which is like they play it for laughs and it is sort of funny, but it's also fucking gross. Well, but also we Zeus Zeus is such an audience surrogate in a way that McLean isn't in this, where Zeus has all the reactions that we would have. And that's like the why Zeus actually is, is sort of feels like the real protagonist. Kind of like how Hans was considered the real protagonist by McTiernan or D'Souza in the first movie. Zeus really is like if you saw if you just met some guy who nonchalantly starts dragging half of a corpse around like grab the other half like <laughs> that's <laughs> fucked up man yeah. you know and and zeus i don't know we're not if zeus's reactions to john were played for laughs maybe this would seem like a racist movie but the entire time we're like no nah, zeus is i trust zeus i would never get, like, get in a fucking you know an elevator fuck no a car absolutely not a building probably not a boat? No. Helicopter? Not going to happen. <laughs> Wait, what would you get close to him? I would not. There's no situation. Yeah. Hey, speaking of elevators, we're talking franchises here. Everyone's like, oh, Captain America, the freaking scene in the elevator. Die Hard with a Vengeance has a baller elevator scene that is extremely upsetting and extremely sick. Yeah, this, the scene with any scene with Captain America is shitty because he's so shiny he's so fucking shiny there's no grit to the cap'n yeah it'd be cool if he uh if we saw him like just like p- pistol whipping a nazi until his face melted or something i'm gonna say something that's gonna maybe make you a little angry uh-oh i'm gonna do it anyway so the christopher nolan version of that elevator i'm sorry the christopher nolan version of that elevator scene would have been like you said lift you said the phrase backwards. You, but like they just sprinkle in all the little Euro shit. And then, I mean, maybe I missed it, but they don't actually explain why he knows that they're bad Oh, you guys. missed it. No, you missed it. It's actually oh. really good writing. Yeah, Earlier what do you in say? the movie, they talk about how all the, the detectives play No, I know. That's what I'm saying. They, but he doesn't actually- Hold on. There's no scene yes, where he's he like- does. Oh, no, he does? Yes, there's a cut to the shot of the badge yeah. that one of the Euros No, I saw that. And he asked It's the same it. badge as his friend. But there's no like explanation for like that's my friend's badge number and you said the word lift and you said dogs and cats instead of cats and dogs like he doesn't we just as audience members get to live through it and figure it out with him and be like oh, that's how he's gonna find out that they're the bad guys and blow them away yeah yeah it was good it was a really great scene and disgusting it's it's yeah oh my god the blood in that scene is like holy shit yeah the, like he covers up the guy's head with his hand and just like blows his head off and just like it's covered. In blood. It's and I really upsetting. The callback where he's like, oh, it's not my blood. That was a nice little callback from Juan as well. So let's talk about the elephant in the room. And yes, by that I mean the GOP. There is both a uh, Donald Trump joke, the orange yep. buffoon himself, and a Hillary Clinton reference as a future president. Yeah, the 42nd president or whatever. It was really now strange. She'd be the 43rd president. Um, Yes. So it just goes to show how moribund our democracy is that... Yes. Like 11 years before the 2016 election, both those people were like punchlines in a Die Hard movie. Wait, 21 years? Holy shit, that's even worse. <laughs> yeah, they fucking predicted this shit 20 years ago that Trump and Clinton would be, Jesus Christ, that knew that there would be huge figures. Central figures in our horrible culture. <laughs> yeah, it's bonkers. Yikes. You know what a great scene in this movie is? The, the, the fact that the, the problem with two is that like, William Sadler's an asshole, John Amos is an asshole, and, you know, the dictator of Val Verde is so, like, anodyne, I can't even remember anything about him, really. And Jeremy Irons is so electric in this movie. The scene where McLean talks about Hans with Simon, you know, your brother was an asshole. Yeah, goes, that scene ruled. You know, he was like an asshole. And he goes, like, he was, he was an asshole. You, you got his number. Like, yeah. that, that exchange? Yeah. That's, like... Really good writing and really good acting. I think the the lotto scene was really good writing. Like the first one where you learn about their lotto like habit. I don't know. He like this this screenwriter knows how to write scenes where people are talking to each other and you just like can feel them. You just you just like have been there or maybe you haven't, but like you can just be a part of that scene. And that scene where like you can really see in the same as the first one when Hans and McLean get to finally meet both the first time when he's with his American accent and then at the very end when he kills him. Like, there's a connection there between the villain and the hero. 
there's intimacy there and like yeah. you think about it too where people are like oh my god John we've got to go to the church and the bad guys are like kill them all bitch and it's yeah. like there's none of that it sucks so I want to draw your attention to the end of the movie um, okay well, I it- thought we're, we don't have to stop talking about the rest of the movie but I, I'm walking on uh, thin ice here with you because you are you you uh, Die Hard has become something of a third rail in our relationships I'm going to walk this very carefully I would I would argue the last lines of Die Hard with a Vengeance show the total inversion from Die Hard One. Okay, I mean I'm ready okay. to talk Die Hard One. That's fine. It just seems like but you're you get, not you get you're not ready to talk ma- you to me. You get very mad about it. You get okay. very mad because y- you're having trouble separating out feelings you're having about the movie, and that's I'm fine. I'm not. Okay. I'm not. You are. I just you're see it differently than you. You're a troubled man. Okay, so at the end of Die Hard One, famously, Reginald Val Johnson is like. You got a good man, Holland McLean. You take care of him. He's a John McLean rules. He kicks ass. This yeah. guy owns. Blew okay. up a building, killed a bunch of guys, covered in blood. Looks like shit. Coolest guy I've ever met. Talk yeah. about murder again. The end of three, McLean's like, oh, fuck. I left my wife on hold. And Zeus is like, call her. He's like, oh, she's going to be mad at me. And he's like, dude, call your wife. And the last lines are, I don't know, Zeus. Like I said, she's a very stubborn woman. And Zeus goes, last line of the movie, she'd have to be to say Mary to you. But that's like a callback. That's a callback to one. But it's an inversion. In a way, of it. in the first movie, they're like, "Holly, you take look. He may be a handful. You may not always get no, along no. with John, but he's I mean, right." And you got. I mean, the line where she says, "Oh, John's still alive because there's no one who can make anyone so fucking angry as John McClane." Right. But in this movie, she's saying that, and one is a loving like, "Ugh, because he's stubborn, he did save our asses, thus justifying all of his other behavior." And in this movie, Zeus is like. Yeah, it's it's fucked up. Like it's nuts that anyone would be married to you at any point. Like you're you are a very unhealthy man. <laughs> like, like that's the the last line of the movie is Zeus just being like, John, like your shit is fucked. That's what I like I like about this movie is that where the first one, the main story is about an awful person making a person that is like really regrets killing a kid back to being an awful person. And we're like, that's the friendship is based on just murder and, and just violence. Where here we have the same sort of thing where you can actually have a buddy where John McClane gets a buddy. But the whole time the buddy is there to be like, dude, you're so fucked up. Dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? He never becomes a John McClane. He becomes the opposite of John McClane. And they still like have a weird friendship that it's sort of it, it does feel like it's earned their friendship. But you always do get a sense that. It's not going to last much longer than this oh, one incident. I don't incident. think it's a friendship. I think Zeus sees John like a broken child he has to mentor like those kids on the block who he has to be like, don't do stupid stuff. Yeah. Well, but it's maybe not friendship, but caring. There is caring between them. And John doesn't really care about anyone. And I think that it's not a reciprocal friend, like nurturing one. It's just this stranger. I really like that scene where he's like, all right, partner, what do you want to do next? He's like, dude, what the fuck? I don't like you. I'm not your anything other than a stranger to you. So please shut the fuck up. I like that he maintains that distance, but also does by the end, like, I don't know. They do. They they talk together. They solve puzzles together. They jump on boats together. There is like a connection between the two, which makes sense. But he doesn't become corrupted. I think that's my main point is Zeus is never turns into a Powell. He doesn't go full McLean. Right. He doesn't. He's not trying to be the kind of man McLean is at all. Yeah. Nothing about nothing about McLean inspires him. He's trying to like contain and focus McLean's energy to get through this specific problem. So they don't get this very weird patronizing relationship by the end. It's a lot more interesting. Um, and again, I think the fact that like we see Zeus encounter violent homicidal racism and overcome it, not because he's part of a Die Hard movie, because he's black and trying to use a phone. You know what yeah, I mean? Like it's th- so that's, good. I think right, it's like, re- that's like that shit. Including it, it does. It's some. I don't know why it doesn't feel heavy handed, but for some reason it just like really lands. And I think maybe because the racism that he encounters is encompassed within a movie where shit is blowing up all the time, and like those stakes seem so giant. Which brings down maybe in another movie a scene where it's like, I saw you jump a tur- turnstile, so I'm gonna blow you away because you're black. Like in like another movie that might have been like, oh god, this doesn't work. But in a diehard movie, it actually really lands. 
Well, it, it just shows that, like, you know, John is always like, you're obsessed with race. You're the racist. And, like, because <laughs> he's this, like, fucking drunk, apolitical, like, white loser who has no comprehension of the world. And Zeus is like, when he says, I ain't your partner, I ain't your neighbor, your brother, or your friend, I'm your total stranger. Like, what he's saying is, the life I live, I don't get to choose whether or not things are racialized. That's not a choice I get to make. That's the reality that I live in. So, so like, you know. I want to ask. He, yeah, go ahead. I just want to ask you a question because this movie was also probably misunderstood. And I think it's much clearer, but like this movie also gives a space for the same kind of people that think John McClane is cool to keep thinking John McClane is cool because they're like, yeah, that guy is racist. And like he still gets, he still wins at the end of the day. I think this is a much more clear cut, but still it does you know it does like make you grapple with the awfulness of john mcclain and it still allows for you if you don't want to grapple with it to be like cool hero speaks my truth kills peace, p- kills thieves and terrorists a plus john mcclain I, you know i don't know if i entirely agree with that because again at the end of the first two movies he's like literally rapturously embraced by his wife and a crowd of people who all praise him unambiguously yeah. he gets he wins the respect of dennis franz in two that's huge okay <laughs> in the end yeah. of, in the end of 3 the only thing he's left wrestling with is his own inability to love someone like his own inability to like reconcile his immaturity rudeness and shittiness with his life partner like that's the, the he's not left with you know, John, we may be different. You're white and I'm black, but I respect you. This is like, no, you're a white piece of shit. Fuck you. Also, holy shit, get your house in order. You're a mess. So I'm just saying, you're right. I'm, I'm sure people could choose how much they wanted to engage with that, but it is unambiguous in the script how we want to see him. And the, the Rodney King line is cutting and really good. This movie came out in 95, it's, okay? Yeah, it's so, <laughs> really fun. Like, there are some, the gold bar shit, was hilarious. I don't know if you had as much joy just watching uh, Zeus want to steal that one gold bar and then he leaves it behind and that, that little thing was like That five was minutes. my gold bar. That was my yeah. gold bar. I have such a good joke. <laughs> it was yeah. a great moment. I think that's like the Rodney King line is it's a funny joke but it's also like we were joking about it in a serious way on the last episode. We're like, shit, John McClane is now a member of the LAPD. Perfect timing. And it's like, yeah, this is like who he is. He's a maniac who would beat the fuck out of someone and you know he does he's he does like all he all wants to do yeah. is murder people and beat people up it's he's a disgusting person i'm so looking forward to the next i'm, I'm gonna go right into it i don't even know how, how where we're at in the episode but i am not asking when will it end because i remember die hard 4 being very fun but Die Hard 3 moving into a die hard 4 like this is the energy i want out of a john mcclain yeah i want someone who is shitty. I want someone who thinks he's doing good and not doing good. And I'm hoping that maybe four will get him to a, like maybe four will be the moment where he starts to actually understand that he's bad. And I don't know, like I'm sort of excited to see now that it's much more overt that he's a piece of shit. Like where's four going to go? Is it going to just like be about him being a piece of shit? Even more so. I saw four in theaters with my dad and we had a blast. So I have nothing but fond memories of it. I'm excited to watch it again. Kevin Smith is in it, so that can't be good. But uh, there's a few good lines. I remember his daughter has some funny shit in there. Yeah, look, um, as we've often found, two is usually in these in this system of the franchise world, two is usually a big misstep. This three... It's so true. One of the best threes we've ever seen. This was, again, I think... I gave this a four and a half on Letterboxd because I'm like, can it really be as good as Die Hard, a like functionally perfect film? This is extremely close to being as good as Die Hard. Like, I would watch this again tonight. It's fun to watch. It's good. It is fun. And this is this is what we're missing. Like, two is not fun. It didn't know how to write a story about shit blowing up and people shooting each other that's fun. And honestly, now that I'm 35, no longer 12, but watching this shit for a long, long time, it is hard to make a movie things blowing up are not fun to watch for more than once i think this did that brilliant thing where it's like opens up i forget what song it was uptown girl some songs playing it's a really catchy tune hard cut out as a building blows up and like oh shit that's an explosion it was actually really cool like i love watching movies from the 90s where they just actually blow shit up and cars are flying around 
Oh, in in downtown Manhattan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That what, was actually. Now, why did they stop that? Why they that they didn't do that as much? This was before two thousand one, I think. Ah, uh, yes. And the yes, planes yes, yes. came in two thousand and one. Right. And then everything after the planes. Don't do that anymore, please. But what I was uh, saying is they introduced the bomb right up. The like, first thing you see is a bomb blowing up. And then throughout the movie, there's a series of bombs, but you actually only get three like real explosions. You get the subway one after that. And then you get the boat, which looks really weird because they decided to like do the Death Star thing where they threw a, a weird sea explosion ring on it. But I just like that, you know, you think the school's going to blow up. You think this is going to blow up. And they sort of like tease you by introducing bombs all over the place, but actually using the explosion and the like, whoa, moments very sparingly. Yeah, I think also brilliantly, they basically just copy that aspect of one where the bad guy is a clever guy with a really good plan. And you're like, yeah. damn, that's like that's a good plan, you know? And I just, it also talk, talk about how, how really pulling the, the Emperor's New Clothes situation about uh, – too like that plan i don't even understand it it sucks that it didn't make any fucking sense it's so weird and it's it's especially like the weirdest plan thinking back on is like the scene where he's like when he bumps into the main bad guy at the airport and he's like you look familiar like why was that even in the movie why did they it's like uh, the tension they chose to try to pull out of that was real fucking dumb um but you didn't did you answer your question are you are you asking not at all. I, I liked watching four, and I want to see it again. Uh, I am not asking when it will end. I'm back on the. I'm back on the the diehard exploding train. I'm all about it. Oh God, get off that train! It's gonna blow up. Or drive it through a friggin' station, baby. Okay, so, let's talk MVP. I don't know. You can help me. I have a pick, and then I have another pick. I'm gonna say pick number one, and you can tell me if it's too silly, and then I'll just edit this all out. And then I'll go with my other one. Okay. Uh, Jerry, the truck driver. Get the fuck out of here. No, Jerry's amazing. Might be my MVP. I got a lot of energy from uh, a a lot of Chris Farley in Wayne's World energy. The the, the mysteriously well-informed bouncer character. (laughs) But it's believable, too. I love the scene where they're driving up and he's just like, Spout like you know the most fucking exciting thing about this underground tunnel, and John is like, "What the fuck is going on?" He nails it. He's only in the scene for a movie for a couple moments, but uh, he really did get me to believe. And actually, I, we've been really lauding this movie up. For me, the final like maybe sixth, like the last twenty minutes, where they fucking suddenly are in Canada, uh, it sort of reminded me. Oh my god, I'm gonna do it again. I'm gonna do it again. Dark Knight. Felt had a lot of Dark Knight vibes. I, I'm sorry. You're you're shaking your you're looking down. I don't mean to anger you. Why? So diehardious. Just the fact that like okay, so they the school doesn't blow up. Oh wait, suddenly they're on the boat that's gonna blow up. Oh, suddenly they have to go to Canada and not blow up. It's just like it was a series of things that kept getting added on just so we could resolve this very complicated story. And that's like the only real negative critique I have for this movie is that just tighten up that last half hour. Just tighten that up. Maybe get it down to 15 minutes. Yeah, fair, fair enough. I guess at that point I was like, you know, I was so the glow was in my cheeks so much right. that I was just I was like, bring it on, baby. And I think that's why Jerry does work for me is that he carries me through a lot of this like post like it's sort of like, again, Lord of the Rings did it. Or it's like I thought this movie would be over by now. But then Jerry shows up. I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna keep watching this as he gets me through these weird tunnels. So yeah, he rolls though. My other my my main pick is of course Zeus. Like Zeus fucking I mean, the movie wouldn't have worked without him. Zeus owns, we stand a Zeus in this house. My MVP Charlie the Bomb Guy. I oh. love Charlie the Bomb Guy. <laughs> Played by the great Kevin Chamberlain, he is having what seems like a world of fun playing Charlie Weiss, the bomb guy. He freaks everybody out with his little uh, chemistry lesson. Yeah. He says cool shit like, no guts, no glory, before cutting a wire. Uh, he says that every time he cuts a wire, he's like, no guts, no glory. No guts, no glory. I, I mean, that's, I, if, if you were that, and let me say this, not only did do I was I blown away by how good he is, IMDb user The Day the World Froze on his list Black Ops 3 2016 Dreamcast. Number one. 
No. Number one. Number about one. About Selena Gomez. About what? Ryan Reynolds. What? About Christopher Maloney. That's about ridiculous. Katie Sackhoff. This is not real. Above Will Smith. <laughs> what the fuck? This list is wild. Wait, but number but... one with a bullet. Chick, chick, no guts, no glory. Kevin Chamberlain. Wow. Does Will has Will Smith seen this list? I hope not. It seems like Will Smith's life is fragile enough right now without getting a blow like that, realizing he's been eighth billed to the great Kevin Chamberlain. That's I rough. think what this movie does, this is a perfect, it might even be better than, I don't know, I'd have to watch one again at this point, but while the first one was very, just like all the characters were so goofy, like, I like it. I like your MV pick from last time or the first time was, you know, the main cop and the the... FBI guys like but it's to this like almost cartoonish level of goofiness about how silly they all are where this one it has all these side characters I love the police guy that goes and runs in and kicks down the door and tries to save the kids like that guy when they find the body of his 6991 guy there's like even for John McClane that's the closest to something sad happening to John McClane is seeing a cop die and even though you hate John McClane like, there's a moment of feeling there. I think they really nailed all the side characters to work, not in, like, the way they did in the first one, but just, like, actually work as character development. I think I like this one more than Die Hard. I think so, too. Wow. Yeah, this is better than Die Hard. This is big. This is, like, a big finale. I mean, we're not close to the finale. We've got two more movies to go. But this is a moment, my friend. A moment. Yeah. And who knows? If, or if my memory serves me, four might be better than three. Okay, that would surprise me at that point. Um, But... That said, uh, yes, next up, ooh, I hit my mic there. Next up on the podcast, Live Free, or what's the alternative to that, Charles? Get if, the I, if I was fuck to say, out of here. Live Free, get the fuck out of here, Die Hard. <laughs> I mean, hey, let me say this. Wait, we're not done? Can I do a mild spoiler? Of Die Hard 4? Yeah. Of course, yeah, of course. You know who the bad guy is, right? Wait, like the actor? You know which actor they cast as the bad guy? It's not the elephant, right? Uh, yeah. They brought out <laughs> yeah. freaking Timothy the Elephant Oliphant. And if you want me to fall in love with a movie, you bring a friend of mine named Timmy McOles. I thought Timmy he was Oliphant, in there. The Elephant. That's how memorable he is, is that uh, I'm very bad with names and I'm very bad with people, but... That whole move, I don't know, Justin Long, I everyone sort of hated him. I I thought, I, I, I like Justin Long. I I, I like Justin. Door Long. Just what what do you Well, so let's we'll wrap this up. We're going to we'll talk Justin in, a lot look, next hey, episode. Fans, we'll talk long. We'll go long. We'll go long. We're going long. Don't worry. Let me just leave everyone with this little tidbit. Charles, mm-hmm. Die Hard 4 is based on a script unrelated to Die Hard called World War 3. Dot com. We'll see you next week for <laughs> Live Bye-bye. Free or Get the Fuck, fuck Out of Here. Outta here.